You majored in sociolinguistics at university. What was it about this field of linguistics that attracted you? <clears throat> well, I started as a major in um, literature because English was, I, I didn't know what linguistics as a subject. Uh, but very rapidly, I came under the influence of um, anthropology professor Roger Keesing, who taught a freshman s seminar called Language and Society. Um, he was working on Solomon Islands pigeon in the Pacific, um, which was similar to Guyanese Creole in some respects. And, and that alone interested me, and I, I showed some of the similarities uh, in the book. I, maybe it was because of similar results due to parallel socio-historical circumstances. I, I mentioned this in page 75. So um, I wrote a final paper on Guyanese Creole for that class, and Keesing in turn introduced me to the work of Lebov, Fishman, and other sociolinguists that would later, later be, who would later become my mentors and colleagues. <clears throat> the funny thing is, later on, he, he wrote a book called Melanesian Pigeon and the Oceanic Substrate. And on the back of that book um, was an advertisement for my book <laughs> on Guyanese Creole, Dimensions of a Creole Continuum. So I always liked that, the fact that we were kind of married, in a sense, uh, <laughs> intellectually um, in our, our books by Stanford University Press. But sociolinguistics was a brand new field. The very first books um, in the field had been um, introduced in the late 1960s, just a year or two before I started. And um, they had a lot of room for innovation because if you think about it in, in literature, which I still love, it was very hard to write a new book about Shakespeare. I mean, there have been thousands of theses and books. Not to say that you, you can't, but, you know, in, in sociolinguistics, I felt it was brand new and there was vast scope for me to be innovative. Um, so I designed my own major, actually, in sociolinguistics. And it's probably the, the first degree granted in sociolinguistics, as far as I know, anywhere, because it was brand new. I was also very influenced by a British sociolinguist who I never, um, he never actually taught me, but his name was Robert LePage, LePage, L-E-P-A-G-E. -E. Uh, he wrote a very famous paper in 1968 or 66, arguing that the very the poor pass rates of students in the West Indies um, was because teachers did not understand that it was a systematic relation between the Creole and the, and the English versions. And they expected the children just to speak English and write English as though they were native fluent speakers. So when I designed my major, I, I, I looked at what he has suggested you should you should have to train teachers, and I included courses in linguistics, in sociology, in anthropology, and so on. And I, at first, I wanted to become a linguistic specialist who would go back and work with teachers. See, I had no conception of myself as being able to remain in the United States. I, I got a scholarship for my bachelor's degree, but most U.S. scholarships were close to me I wasn't a U.S. citizen at the time. So I expected I would go back home and I teach high school and I become a specialist in working with teachers. But in fact, I got a chance to go on to graduate school and, and I did. Okay. Tell us about the development of your interest in and your work on Black Talk. Well, my interest in Black Talk, um, meaning both African-American vernacular English and the Creole Englishes of Guyana and the Caribbean, um, which Edward Kamabrafford calls nation language, had begun even as an undergraduate at University of California, Santa Cruz. When I went out to the South Carolina Sea Islands in spring 1970, another one of Blake's, Herman Blake's uh, brilliant ideas, which I talk about in Chapter 12, I was treated to many mesmerizing examples of black talk in this Gullah or Geechee region, but 
probably none more so than the prayers of Deacon Walter Plummy Simmons, who, um, referring to the young people in the community, um, proclaimed in one prayer to, to the mournful singing of his wife, Agnes, that the train they're riding on is full of dead man's bones. Make them know, our Father, that the house is on fire and the roof is not burning down. Make them know, our Father, that when you thunder in the east, no one can thunder in the west after you. So this is a man who, he was, he was like a, a farmer, um, and uh, he drove, he drove one, the one tractor on the island. So he wasn't very sophisticated or educated man, but he was a brilliant speaker. And the parallelism of his repeated phrases were poetic and powerful. And I used part of it as a title of my senior on his thesis. The other thing I should say is that the, the island I was on, the Fusky Island, had no bridge connecting it to the mainland. So they didn't have a preacher coming over on Sunday. So the deacon, uh, he was one of the deacons on the island, would give the prayer uh, instead of the sermon as a highlight of his weekly um, uh, activity in the church. But I think it was really in uh, graduate school when, from 1971 when I was working with Bill Lebov, um, a white professor who was at the time the authority on black English in New York and is still the leading figure in sociolinguistics. In fact, he's going to come to Stanford this year He's in his 90s, <laughs> 93 or so, to give one of the keynote speeches. <laughs> but from him, I learned to do field work and to analyze black talk, both in the Guyana and in the United States, in a way that would bring out the subtleties and regularities and features like stress bin. Uh, when you say, I've been at it. I mean, I had it for a long time and I still do. So there are many features of African-American English that people don't really realize that give it extra power and significance. And he, he taught me to really distill those beauties and those strengths of the variety um, in my research and so on. What do you love about Black Talk? Well, I give several examples in Chapter 11 um, from... Anna, a, a market vendor in Guyana, complaining about sales being bad. Um, she said, thing bad, not in ourselves. Uh, and, she, and she varies the levels in terms of deep Creole, sometimes uh, middle-level Creole. Um, to a powerful example um, about Lotan, who's a, not a cattle, cattle farmer in Guyana, recalling the death of his baby, daughter, very, very powerful story, um, where his daughter dies during the night. Um, but funny enough, next door to him, his house, where there's all this sadness, there's preparations for a wedding in the morning. And uh, he said, um, you know, we can't, he said, humbug, we can't, we can't interfere with the wedding. So even though his wife is screaming and so on, he says, uh, neighbors hearing the screaming, they say, uh, they stopped the music they were playing. And he and um, he, then he told his wife, let's get a coffin very quickly. And they actually buried the child at dawn. So between 1 a.m. and 6, 7 o'clock, they were able to get it. Because we, we, we can't interfere with the wedding, just as they can't interfere with, with our grief. And it, But it's very, very powerfully done. And I talk about this. And, you know, we tend to think that um, this eloquent speech only belongs to Shakespeare and, you know, Wordsworth and, and so on and so forth. But very often you find very ordinary people in especially what they call Black Talk uh, illustrate this. Um, the literary master of spoken soul about, at least in terms of, African-American English, is August Wilson, who I had a chance to talk to um, when he came to Stanford in 1999. Uh, and I used his book a lot in my courses because 
I could always find a good example to use, give it an exam, features to look at, and so on. And in in, in Fences, uh, which is was made into a movie a couple of years ago, um, you will see many examples of it. Um, along with James Baldwin, June Jordan, Tony Morrison, Alice Walker, uh, other distinguished writers. In fact, we met Alice Walker a few years ago. He extolled what's called the passion, the skill, and incredible music of black talk. But you can also see it in the um, ordinary talk of black people, as my son Russell, um, who is a professor at Cornell, um, and I showed in our 2000 book, Spoken Soul. Uh, we give many, many examples, and I give several examples in this book too.